Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So today, here we go. Today we are in Matthew chapter 15. I turn to the right spot. Not in Romans. We are in Matthew. All right, here we go. Matthew chapter 15 continues on from where we left last time regarding, keep this in mind as we read, uh, it continues on from last time as we talked about the heart of man. All right. Matthew chapter 15, starting in verse 21. Then Jesus went away from there and withdrew into a district, into the district of Tyre and Sidon. Behold, a Canaanite woman came out from that region and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came to him and kept asking him, saying, Send her away, for she is shouting out after us. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, your faith is great. Be it done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. This is the word of God. Let's go to prayer. Father, we thank you again for today. Thank you again for your mighty word. Lord, speak to our hearts. Give us wisdom and guidance, Lord. I pray that you would open our minds and our ears, uh, open our hearts, Father, to your truths. I pray that you would, uh, again, bless this time, Father, as we study your word. I pray that you would speak through me. Give me wisdom and guidance. In Jesus' name, amen. The supporting scripture for this is found in Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 24. It says very similar things, just kind of fills in a little bit more as far as details. It says, Jesus left that place and went to the region of Tyre, not wanting anyone to know where he was there. He entered a house, but was unable to escape their notice. Instead, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit soon heard about Jesus, and she came and fell at his feet. Now she was a Greek Greek woman of the Syrophoenician origin, and she kept asking Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children have their fill, he said, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then Jesus told her, because of this answer you may go, the demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found her child lying on the bed, and the demon was gone. So again, between both Gospels, you're given a clear picture of what actually happened. Before we go further, let's do a little bit of the history and the setting. Because the the region of Tyre and and Sidon were uh, in Gentile territory. So, I don't know if you can see the map very clearly, uh, but you have Galilee, where Jesus would normally reside, uh, Capernaum and so forth down there, and that little blue dot, which is the Sea of Galilee. With this particular graphic, I probably should have zoomed in a little bit more, you can see kind of the white uh, borders of the territories of some of these areas. But right above the border of Galilee is the Phoenician uh, territory with the cities of Tyre and Sidon, uh, which is modern-day Lebanon, by the way. Uh, Those cities are still there. They are tourist locations. Um, But back in the day, uh, they were Canaanite property. Uh, They were owned by the people of Canaan. Uh, And they, because of where they're located on the coast, uh, they were trading ports, and they would often trade with the Greeks. They were the main... Uh, individuals that would trade with them. And then, of course, the Greeks later on conquered the world, as it was known, 
uh, and so took over that entire area, came down and conquered Israel uh, at one time. That's where you have the, the big rebellion, the Maccabees, uh, Hanukkah, the whole bit. Uh, they rebelled against the Greeks. But when the Greeks came, they brought with them Western culture, which is what uh, makes the bedrock of American culture these days kind of interesting. But um, So all of that to say, this explains why Matthew calls her a Syrophoenician lady because she was from that area. She's also known as a Canaanite lady because in Canaan, that used to be Canaan. Um, and then in Mark, she's also called a Greek. So more than likely, she had mixed, uh, mixed blood, as it were. All of that is very important in these Gospels because it lays kind of a groundwork for the prejudices against those people groups because Israelites were told to go into the land of Canaan and get rid of the people and move into the promised land. And then, of course, they didn't get rid of all of the people, and so some of the people of Canaan stayed and became a snare to the Israelites. Then, of course, you know, again, the Greeks, how they conquered. Um, they were not a... Uh, the Jews and the Greeks didn't get along very well. So this is kind of the stage that is being set. Also note... Uh, that Tyre was actually about 20 miles north of Galilee, and Sidon was about 25 miles more uh, from Tyre. So it's quite a ways in. And it said that Jesus was somewhere in that area, uh, within the border of Galilee and the Phoenician border. Um, again, setting the stage. So what was Jesus doing there? Why was he there? That was not his normal route. I always like how uh, we saw this in the, uh, the story of the Samaritan woman at the well, how Jesus had to go through Samaria. In reality, he didn't, at, in that uh, instance, he didn't have to go through Samaria. That was not the normal route from Galilee down to Jerusalem. In fact, they would travel the valley, go around Samaria. They didn't like Samaria anyway, um, but they would go around Samaria. Well, when Jesus said, I have to go through Samaria, that was like, why? Well, Jesus had an appointment there. That's why he had to go there. And so you might ask, well, why did you go up to the Phoenician area? It's Gentile territory. Why? It's not your normal route. Well, he had an appointment there. This is that appointment. So keep that in mind as we move forward. Also keep in mind that Jesus did reach out to Gentiles. He reached out to the Roman centurion who asked that his servant be healed. Jesus, of course, as we just talked, reached out to the Samaritan woman at the village, or at the well, and then, of course, reached out to her village as well. So he did reach out to Gentiles. Again, laying the groundwork for what we're going to talk about, because this passage seems rather harsh in response until you take it from the appropriate perspective. All right, also to lay some more groundwork, the pagan practices uh, of that area in particular, especially, uh, often would delve into the occult. They would practice witchcraft, uh, they would worship the moon, etc. And it usually, unfortunately, would open them up to the powers of darkness. And God gives man a natural defense against the powers of darkness, but when they begin to delve into that, when they go practice those things, it begins to remove that, uh, that protection. And so, as we read through the Gospels, we'll find multiple people who were demon-possessed. It wasn't something that could just happen. They actually had to practice a certain lifestyle in order to get that way. So I have some scriptures up there. For 
those who belong to Christ, just as a side note, for those who belong to Christ, Satan does not have any power over you. Uh, despite what Hollywood likes to say, a Christian, those who belong to Christ, cannot be indwelt by the powers of darkness. It's just not possible. So again, just as a side note, 1 John 4, 4, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And Romans 8, 31, What shall we say against these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? So if God is dwelling in you, which is good news, you have power over the realm of darkness. He has given us, that's part of salvation. We are given the power over sin. It no longer has a hold on us. And thus, also, the powers of darkness do not have a hold on us. Quick stop at verse 23. Jesus didn't answer her a word, and his disciples came to him and kept asking him, saying, send her away, for she's shouting out after us. She's a bother. She's annoying us. Send her away. Again, the groundwork I laid with the prejudices that would naturally be there, as well as the fact that she was becoming annoying, caused the disciples to ask Jesus, can we just get rid of her, please? Just Can we go about our tasks and not have to deal with her? Again, kind of setting the stage. Really, this entire section of chapter 15 is about prayer. It's about how we interact with God. It's about how we pursue God, how we are called to pursue God. Let's go back to verse 22. And note how she addresses Jesus. Verse 22, she says, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. And note his response to her. Again, a lot of my preface was to help us kind of get a correct perspective on what's coming next. Because first, he was silent. He didn't answer her a word for a period of time. And then he reminded her he was only there for the Jews initially. And then the last kicker was that he essentially called her a dog. I mean, good night. How rude can you get? Again, let's put this into the realm of prayer. This was setting the stage for the disciples. They had a lesson to learn, as do we. But then he was also there for the woman. It's amazing how the great lengths that God goes to in order to capture hearts, in order to touch and capture hearts. Because that's, as you read through the Gospels, Jesus did many healings, he did many miracles, but it was all for the purpose of capturing people's hearts, to validate what he was saying, and to get their attention and again, touch their hearts. Anytime he spoke with individuals, he always went right to the heart of the matter. They would address him regarding some superficial issue, and then he would come back and say, well, how's your heart, essentially? In the perspective of prayer, how often do you feel that God gives you silence when you pray? Sometimes when you pray, you just crickets. I don't hear anything, Lord. Are you there? I don't even hear a dial tone anymore. For those who are, well, I just dated myself. That was horrible. <laughs> I do that sometimes in class. I get my students who look at me and go, what's a dial tone? <laughs> so sometimes when we pray, Initially, we may not get an answer, either yes or no. What is the purpose of that? 
What was the purpose of the, the Phoenician woman? So note how she addressed Jesus. She said, Lord. That's kind of interesting, considering where she comes from. She called him Lord, Master. And then she also called him Son of David. She is not of Jewish descent. That will play into the next answer he gives her. But she's crying out, and she does so frequently, and he doesn't answer her. Why is that? Why is it that he does that with us? Well, there's, if God were to respond exactly how we want him to respond, exactly when he, we want him to respond, how, how strong would our faith be first? Probably not very strong. And then he would just be a genie in the bottle. God, I need something. Need it now. On a, on a time schedule here. Burger King slogan. Slogan. Have it your way. I think it's Burger King. I, did I really? Oh, man. <laughs> so, in this world that we live in, especially in this country, we're used to microwaves and fast food places. So, in other words, we want everything now. Instant coffee, instant orange juice. And when God is quiet, when he's silent, it tends to make us question, Lord, are you there? Do you even care about me? And when we question what's supposed to happen is we're supposed to go back and say, Lord, I know that you care. I know that you are here. I know that you do hear me. So that means I have to wait. But keep pressing in. Lord, I still have this issue. Lord, I still have this issue. But I will wait. I will rest on you. Lord, I will be okay with what your will is for my life. That's the eventual outcome. But sometimes it takes that silence to really stretch our faith, to really make us question, is this God that we're praying to even listening to me? Does he even care? Of course he does. But you have to go back to his truth. You have to hold on to what you know is true. And he did that many times with the Israelites. He would say, look back. Look at all of the things I brought you through. Now stop and consider for a minute. So even when you have that silence, stop and consider. So for the Phoenician woman, as she came to Jesus and asked, begged for a healing for her daughter, she wanted immediate action. And Jesus was delaying his action. Because again, he's after her heart. He wants a true faith, not just going to the vending machine to get what I want. Again, consider the lifestyle she came from also. She's of pagan origin. Her lifestyle actually contributed to her daughter's condition. And so, in one sense, it's like what you've got is because of your choices in life. And when those choices make us crash and burn, to go to God and say, God, fix it. Well, I'll work with you through it, but this is kind of where you're at because of what you chose to do. And so the silence is important because Jesus didn't just respond with, oh, okay, well, there you go. It's all fixed now. It's all better. Go back, go live the way you want to live. There's, again, a purpose in developing her faith through this time. Also, for the disciples' faith, because they got to witness as Jesus heard and how he was going to deal with her. And again, their response is, can we just send her away? She's one of those people. Can we just send her away? She's annoying. Can we just send her away? Now, they were used to people clamoring after Jesus. But again, because of who this woman was, it made her even extra annoying. So again, the silence was to test her faith, was to encourage her faith. And so when she met with silence, 
when he would just ignore her, what was her response? Oh, well, I guess that one failed. Move on. No, she continued on. And that's what Jesus wanted. She continued to press in. She came to him daily, crying out. And then Jesus' response, more to the disciples, but also to her, in verse 24, Jesus answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She addressed him as the son of David, initially. She's not a Jew. So, why are we using this term? Was it to garner more favor? Was, to get, was it to get her into the group? I know the correct phraseology. I've been churched. I know the correct phraseology. Having the correct phraseology means nothing to God. You can, be, you can go to church all your life. You can have all the correct phraseology. You can be Christianized, but never have a heart after Christ. And really, your, your words, your phraseology, your Christianization doesn't mean anything. And so Jesus was saying, you know, you're, you're a Gentile. You're addressing me as a Jew would address me. You are a Gentile. My job, Jesus says, was to go to the Jews first. I always like how he said, I was sent only to the, house, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then in other places, I was sent there first. In Romans 1.16, it said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, this is Paul speaking, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek or Gentile. So Jesus did come to the Jews first. Those were the promised people. He was supposed to come to them first and reveal himself as, I'm the Messiah. And then, of course, according to plan, they would reject him as the Messiah, which would then open the doors for the entire world at that point. But he had to go to the Jews first. But it's kind of an interesting point to bring up again to this woman, because he's dealt with Gentiles before. So she's, it's not like she's new. Oh, I've never dealt with this before. But again, he was bringing her to a point of recognizing who she was. And really, he does that with all of us, Jew or Gentile. Do you know who you are? Do you know who I am? It requires us to admit, you know what? Yeah, I'm, I'm a lost sinner. I'm of, I don't have anything, Lord, that would cause you to go, okay, yeah, I like you. I think I'll choose you for one of my followers because you're, you're kind of a cool person. In reality, it's remember who you are. You're lost. And it's not to rub her nose in it. It's to get her to say and to get us to say, yeah, this is who I am. Be humble. Get us to that point of humility to where we have to acknowledge, I am a sinner, I need Jesus. Again, he's walking her through faith. So remember who you are. Verse 25, but she came and began to bow down before him. Another translation says she, he fell, or she fell at his feet. And she said, Lord, help me. She keeps using the same phraseology. Note, Lord, Master. I love her faith that she exhibits here. She continues to press in and continues to use the, the phraseology of Lord, Master. She's acknowledging who he is. 
And again, he's, he's walking her through developing her faith to where finally at the end, it's going to be, I know who you are and I know who I am and I know that I need you, not just for this issue, but for everything. Verse 26. And this is a very harsh answer on the surface. And he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, again, a little bit of history. People, especially in her region, were often in a derogatory form called dogs by the Jewish people. Uh, they were Gentiles, but they were such that... Um, they were very despised, you might say, by the Jewish people. Uh, and dogs at that time, uh, especially the way the Jews would refer to these people, uh, was as a wild animal, a wild beast, uh, a wild dog that would run about in a pack um, and would scavenge. That's what dogs did. They, they kind of kept things clean. They would scavenge up all the trash. And so to use that phrase, it's still a derogatory term today, uh, but back then, again, it was a very strong derogatory term. But kind of interesting, in the translation, when Jesus said, uh, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs, instead of using the word that often referred to the wild dog, he referred to a pet dog. Unfortunately, we can't see Jesus smile as we read the texts. It's, it's like getting a text on your phone. Sometimes you don't really know the emotion of the individual who just sent it to you. Knowing the Lord's heart, and because he used different words than were normally used, there was a little bit of, in one sense, almost kind of a sarcasm. Uh, there was a little bit of a smile in with what he was saying because it was to provoke her. It was not a derogatory, you disgust me, get away from me. It was, it was to provoke a response in her, and she picked up on that. Because she says in verse 27, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. She picked up on what he was saying. And she was also identifying, I know I'm not a Jew. I don't deserve the blessings of the Jewish people. God promised the Jewish people great blessings if they were faithful to him. And she says, you know, I get it. I, I don't deserve those blessings. I'm, I'm a Gentile of Gentiles. I'm as Gentile as you can get. I have pagan practices. I am... I'm a sinner, Lord. But Lord, surely there's a little bit of compassion even for me. Surely you have just a little bit of love left for me. And again, note how she says, yes, Lord. That's a very key phrase right there. Yes, Lord. It's a, it's a double surrender. Yes. Lord, Master, I'm surrendering and humbling myself before you. In Matthew 18, verse 13, we're told Jesus tells a parable about a Pharisee and a tax collector who go into the temple to pray. And the Pharisee goes into the temple goes forward, lifts his hands, and he says, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. It's amazing to be me. Thank you. Thank you that I'm not like, where is he? Oh, yeah, that tax collector that's way over there. He's, he is such a sinner. Thank you that I'm not like that guy. And then the tax collector, who could barely make it through the door, and he fell to his knees and pounded his chest, not even daring to look to heaven, said, God, forgive me, a sinner. And Jesus said, guess which one went home forgiven that day? 
no surprise, the tax collector. So too, God takes this woman into that type of position. That's what he was after. I want you to be humble. I want you to humble yourself before me and admit that you need God, not just for what you can get, but you need God in your life. Again, this entire chapter, or this entire section of the chapter, rather, is about prayer and what it looks like. Verse 28, then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, your faith is great. Be it done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. Your faith is great. Was that of her own doing, though? No, because you can actually see Jesus building her faith. We're told in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, that no one should boast. It is a gift of God comes right after, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Those two things are coupled. They are a gift from God. Even your faith is a gift of God. So too, her faith was a gift of God. God had an appointment. He met her there in order to capture her heart and build her faith. Imagine her life change as she went home and her daughter was made well. Go home and share with her daughter who wouldn't believe who I met today. I met God today. Our prayer life should include intense times of prayer as we surrender to Christ. In James chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. In Proverbs, we're told that God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. It takes humility to actually come before God with true prayer. In Hebrews 10.22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So prayer is an act of surrendering to God, not just bringing our our requests to him. Because as we pray, we realize, I can't handle this myself. I need God. God, I need you. And then sometimes it goes further, especially during the periods of silence, where our faith is stretched. Sometimes when we hear no, that's even harder. But God, I I really would like this. No, sorry, not in my will. And grappling with that can be very difficult. The hardest words to say during an intense time of prayer is, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. We have that example of when Jesus was in the garden and he prayed, Lord, if it be possible, take this cup away from me, but not my will, but your will be done. We were given that great example. Timothy Keller says, to fail to pray, then, is not, a mere, is not to merely break some religious rule. It is a failure to treat God as God. Prayer oftentimes becomes, and I say this to my shame, oftentimes becomes just a 911 call. Instead of an, a constant, ongoing, moment by moment, walk with God. Oftentimes, it's too easy to get busy and miss the prayer time and miss that separate time, whatever time of the day, dedicated to just praying to God. In Nehemiah, book of Nehemiah, 
Nehemiah is, quick backstory, Nehemiah is a captive in the Babylonian Assyrian Empire. Um, and Jerusalem had been conquered, razed to the ground, and there were people who were supposed to go back and rebuild some of that. And he had heard about it, that it was destroyed and wasn't being rebuilt properly, and it grieved him greatly. And he was moved to prayer. He prayed for months. Intense prayer. So much so that it was noticed by the king. He said he would always try to, you know, he would pray and then he would go work for the king because he was the king's servant, right-hand man. And he, he put on a good face for the king. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. All right. Here to serve you, happily. But the king noticed there's something off about you. What's going on? The really interesting thing about that section in Scripture is it said, Nehemiah said, and then I prayed, and then I answered. And so we have two examples of prayer. The intense one-on-one -on -one prayer with God, which I like to call pre-prayer. And then when he talked to the king, he had a jumping off prayer. Lord, here I go. Give me wisdom. Give me the words. Because if I say something wrong, <laughs> I probably won't live the next 15 minutes. And so we have an example. Be pre prayed. For those who like to prepare, be pre prayed. Suit up ahead of time. Be ready. Be in constant prayer. So when things come your way, you are better equipped to handle those things. And you are able to say, Lord, here I go. I'm in the middle of something. Give me wisdom. Not that he won't answer those anyway, but rather than making a constant 911 call to God, spend intimate time with him beforehand. We don't always get the answer we want, but we are called to fervently pray, pray about situations. In Luke 18, verses 1 through 18, we're told of a parable. I won't read it all, but we're told, Jesus told a parable of the uh, unjust judge who was to hear a widow's case, and she continued to press the judge every day. And he said, you know, I fear neither God nor man, but I'm going to do as this widow asks because she's driving me nuts. And God said, Jesus said, you know, God is obviously not like the unjust judge, but take a note from the widow's book. Continue to press into God the same way. Pound at his door. Be like the Syrophoenician woman here. Continue to bother Jesus. It was not a bother. That's what he wanted. Because as you press more and more and more into God, continue to, Lord, this is what I'm dealing with. You are laying that more and more and more at the foot of the cross. Those who seek Christ are never turned away. And he always keeps them as it says in John 6, 37. All the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. This is in regard to salvation. And John 10, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will ever snatch them out of my hand. We have his promise to hold us, to keep us. So how do we pray? We have... We always hear, you need to pray more. You need to be diligent in prayer. Scripture, pray unceasingly. What does that look like? Well, there are, again, different ways to pray. Walking with God each day, each moment of the day. Now, consider for those who belong to Christ, we have the great benefit of the God of all creation dwelling within our hearts. He is with us every moment of every day. He is with us through every thought, every emotion, 
every step we take. Include him in every step that you take. Be aware of the fact that he's there with you. Talk to him. Walk with him. Have conversations with him about stuff. He is your father and best friend. I encourage you, if you don't already, have a set time of prayer, even five minutes in the day, to where you just turn off the phone or put the phone away, whatever, close the door, and just you and God. Try it, five minutes a day. See what happens. Include praise in your prayer. In the Lord's Prayer, as it's called, Jesus gives an example of how to pray. And he includes uh, praise in his prayer. Hallowed be your name, he says to the Father. Great is your name. I praise your name. There's always something to praise Jesus for. At the very least, we can always praise him for hope and salvation, that he's always with us. Join prayer with others. That's another way to pray. Praying with a group of people about something. There is something very unique in that. And God tells us it's unique because our hearts are joining as one as we together lift up a petition to him and enter into his throne room. Praying with fasting. Give something up to God. It doesn't always have to be food. Give something up to God for a short period and spend that time in prayer. Anytime you do something regularly, social media is a, is a big thing. If you find you pull out your phone frequently, and I'm an offender, to, in a quiet moment, look at social media. Maybe go, you know what? I'm going to set that down today. So anytime I'm prompted, anytime that reaction comes up, maybe say a prayer. Use it to remind you to pray. That's how fasting works. And again, continue to talk to him as your father, your Lord and your friend. I was reading something here recently that said, a simple prayer can change your life. That little title caught my attention. I was like, all right, lay it on me. What's this prayer? I'm always kind of critical when it comes to some of that stuff. And this individual said, The prayer that changed his life, two words, yes, Lord, just like we read over here in verse 27, yes, Lord. He goes on to say, yes, Lord, is a prayer of surrender. It's a prayer of obedience, of faith, confession, gratitude, humility, brokenness, sacrifice, and trust. When you can honestly say to God with all of your heart, yes, Lord. Again, it's it's akin to saying, your will be done. I surrender to you. Whatever your answer is, I'm okay with. may not be great and fantastic to me, but I'm okay with it because you're God. And I know that you love me, that you're with me, and that... Through this, you will be glorified. He continues, every time I pray these two words, I place God first in my life. So he'll start his prayer, yes, Lord, and then continue, just like the the lady did here. Yes, Lord, but this is what I need. I'm struggling with this. But yes, Lord. So questions. Will you say yes, Lord, to Jesus today? If you don't know Christ, will you say yes to him today? Will you surrender to him today? If you do know Christ, are you able to say yes, Lord, in the context of, Lord, whatever 
your will is for my life. I will follow you. Again, and again, my encouragement to you is continue to walk with Jesus. Know him more. Keep pressing into him with prayer. Make prayer a must in your life. Make it an everyday thing, not just when you need something. Talk to him. Develop that relationship with him. That's what he's after. Every time you read through the Gospels, every instance that he comes in contact with somebody, that is a divine appointment. There are no accidents in God's book. And again, this, there are times where it's, it stands out. Jesus went someplace specifically to meet one person. Out of millions of people, one person. So it always amazes me. And the same goes with us. Out of millions of people, he reached out to you. And to you. And to me. Because he wants our hearts. He wants that relationship with us. He wants us humble before him and walking with him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you again for your word. Father, thank you that we can come to you in prayer, that you always hear us, that you are always with us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can trust you as we say, yes, Lord. Your will be done. Thank you that we can rest in you. Continue to bless us today, Lord, through the rest of the service. I pray that you would bless us this week. Strengthen us, Father. Help us to make prayer important in our lives, that we would walk with you and talk with you daily and have that set time, Lord, to pray with you. We love you, Jesus, and we praise your holy name. Amen.